Welcome to Kyushu, Japan's third largest island. Famous for its spectacular nature, fascinating culture, and unforgettable food. There are seven picture perfect prefectures on Kyushu, including Oita. Last time we traveled inland, soaking our senses in one of the many steaming natural hot springs formed by the volcanic activity in this area. This is so nice. We went from picking yuzu to eating wagyu and experiencing the drama of world-class taiko drumming. All with a side of breathtaking scenery. But today's travels start by the bay. Everybody. I think it's about 6.30 a.m. right now and we're about to get onto a fishing boat cruise. Never done this before and we're gonna catch some fish, I suppose. Let's go. <laughs> My name is Hannah, or currently Hannah, on YouTube, where I've been exploring Japan and making videos for the past three years. Right now, I'm going solo in Japan and exploring the wonders of Kyushu. And our adventure begins right here in Beppu Bay. Ready, ready to cruise. <laughs> Beppu Bay fishing boat cruises take you across Beppu Bay to the local fish market in time for breakfast. And what better way to cruise than with a professional fisherman as your guide? <laughs> Captain Nakayama tells me that the native Shiroshita flatfish are the regional specialty but the bay is also home to conger eel, Spanish mackerel, yellowtail, and snapper. So they catch all kinds of different fish in this area, and then later on, when we go to the fishing market, you get to try them fresh from the bay right here. Very exciting. And as the sun rises and the fog starts to lift, my morning gets even better. Apparently I'm allowed to drive the boat. I don't know if they should trust me. <laughs> Is that a thing people say on boats? I don't know. <laughs> yo ho, yo ho, a pirate's life for me. A fuel! I can do! Yo! So we've arrived at the Orga fish market now and this is my first time ever at any kind of fish market and especially my first time at any auction. So over there they've got all of the catches for the day and then there's a man, he's just, he's just got like a long stick and he points at things and he's like, hoi, hoi. It's really cool to see one on a local scale like this. You really get a feel for what this town is like. In a fish market like this, you'll really likely come across a lot of different varieties of fish and seafood that's actually quite rare to see in Australia. And there are plenty of little treasures to discover. Actually really beautiful, super colourful and big, like massive. <laughs> Everything moves so fast. Everything just keeps getting sold like so quickly. We're getting the snapper. Apparently you can eat this just as sashimi. And it's only costing 2,600 yen, so that's about 30 Australian dollars. Hi, arigatou gozaimasu. Hi, arigatou Let's eat. In the streets surrounding this market, you'll find humble little restaurants, just like this one where the chef will clean, fillet, and prepare your catch of the day. Chef Kakisako is turning my snapper into sashimi, but he's also got some other specialties in store for me too. Wow, this looks so good. Thai sashimi. Wow, so Maybe I'll start with the Thai. Maybe typically you're supposed to put the sashimi in the soy sauce like this. Let's see how this tastes. Mmm. Oh. We see this. Mm. It tastes really good with the soy sauce. They've got a different variety of different kinds of fish. It's all been tempered, which is coated in like a Japanese breadcrumb and deep fried. Mmm. It's so crunchy. Oh yeah. That's really good. Let's see this. Mmm. 
So this is a miso soup and inside they've got some little, I guess you could call them like fish dumplings, fish cakes. It tastes very different to regular kind of miso soup. Ah, like that, I see. Mmm. Daikon. Daikon. Daikon, which is a kind of long Japanese white radish, and then they will pickle them. It's a kind of salty, kind of semi sweet little pickled vegetables that they always have on the side of meals. And it's very crunchy. It goes really nicely. There's such a, a nice balance of flavors in every Japanese meal. So if you come to Japan, you should definitely try this Japanese style breakfast. It's actually, it's all very healthy for you, much healthier than cereal in my opinion, but I guarantee that you'll enjoy it if you like seafood. here in Nakatsu, a castle town of Oita Prefecture, famous for its traditional Japanese paper umbrellas, or wagasa. Konnichiwa, Hana desu. Ah, konnichiwa. Wagasa kobo no Kajiwara Akemi Kajiwara is one of the artisans who keep this 300-year-old tradition alive, and it's one of the only two remaining in Kyushu. It takes around 70 steps to create one of these wagasa, and each one is painstakingly produced by hand from building the frame to applying the paper and then sealing it with oil and then sun drying it for 10 days. It's a very meticulous process. It's all about the details, I love it. All up, these umbrellas take around two months to complete. Oh, wow, it's hey, so dozo. beautiful. Oh, thank you. Ooh, I feel so glamorous. <laughs> Some of these same techniques are used to make these beautiful paper lamps, which when lit, look so stunning. And I even get to give it a go. This one seems a lot more my size. <laughs> Small size. Small size. Yes. <laughs> Wagasa are a cultural symbol of Japan, and there's a long history of their use in religious celebrations, weddings, and festivals. They're also used as props in Japanese traditional dances and tea ceremonies. Can I just say I love that they're using a spork to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Today, the wagasa and lamps like I'm making are sold as works of art or souvenirs. And they've become such an attraction, the whole town is benefiting from their popularity. Oh, I could see myself losing hours doing this. This is, this is really quite fun, actually. And from one very relaxing cultural activity, I go to something a little more active. So I've been told that inside this gym right here, I'll get to try a traditional samurai experience. I've got no idea what that means, but I'm really excited to check it out. Let's go. Konnichiwa. Iaido has around 400 years of history, one of Japan's most traditional martial arts. Fellow Aussie expat Nathan Baston has spent the past 14 years studying it under Iaidoka Yoshinobu Azuma. You can speak in English if you like. Ah, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> so I understand you're going to show me some traditional samurai culture? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. You can have a Where seat and we'll, we'll get started. All right, cool. There are four common styles of martial arts in Japan, and this one is all about the sword. There are only 12 basic moves. Easy, right? Uh, would you like to try? Yeah, I'd love okay. to. Well, you have to go and get changed okay. first. All right. Ta -da! How do I look? And after a brief costume change, mm -hmm. I'm ready to cross swords with these sensei. It's pretty heavy. Is this real? It's not a real sword, oh, okay. so you don't have to worry about it. Okay, thank goodness. The Iaido moves involve drawing your sword, <laughs> okay, okay. striking your opponent, hey. 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 removing the blood from the blade, and then replacing it in the scabbard. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Ah, yeah. <laughs> but the ultimate aim is to psych out your enemy without ever drawing your sword. <laughs> 
So is that a move? Did I yeah, just learn one of the that's, moves? That's the first one. That's the first thing we learned. <laughs> okay. Oh, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Um, I've clearly easy. still got a long way to go with my training sword, but one thing's for sure. I definitely think twice before arguing with Mr. Azuma and his razor sharp sword. So his sword oh, is a real sword. sword. Hi. He doesn't even let me hold it. Oh, really? Oh. <laughs> I feel so special right now. <laughs> wow, and it's got this beautiful inscription on the. Yes. It's such a great experience. I think if anyone's coming to Japan and you want to dive a little bit deeper into the culture, you want to try something that's that's really different from the usual things to see in Japan. This was a super interesting experience. I think you'd love it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Arigatou gozaimasu. so beautiful it feels like it feels like I've been transported back in time to like a very traditional old-school Japanese village this is actually a castle village here in Japan and it's called Kitsuki City it's so beautiful all of the buildings have the really old-school traditional Japanese thatched roofs and these walls and moats around it it's so nice It's so easy to take good photos in Japan because everything is so beautiful and everyone's always so nice and friendly and they'll happily be in your photos. It's really nice. So I've just arrived at Kitsuki City's Nakano Sake Brewery and we're going to take a little behind the scenes tour to see how it's made and hopefully we'll get to try some. Nakano Sake Brewery has been operating since 1844, so its building and grounds feel steeped in tradition. The struggle of wearing mm -hmm. shoes with laces in Japan. And as soon as I'm out of these shoes, Mr. Nakano introduces me to my first beverage for the day the pristine natural waters of this globally important agricultural heritage system site, and the first of the ingredients that make this sake so special. It's from 200 meters underground. That's crazy. Whoa. This looks like premium water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, oh, damn. That's really good. Thank you. Ooh. Wow. It's like taller than me. And after getting the ins and outs of the antique brewing barrels in the museum, it's time to check out the rice. Wow, it's so smooth. It's really different to regular rice. I never see rice like this in Australia. <laughs> Mr. Nakano takes me through each step of the process. Oh, really? I get to make it? Cool, yeah, that's good. Hi. From washing to steaming and mixing. Wow, that's actually really hard to do. It's perfect. Perfect? Yeah. All right. Got a new job in case YouTube doesn't work out for me. <laughs> and then we get to check out the fermentation process, where the special yeast has turned the rice pink. <gasps> Wow! Oh my gosh! It's so pink! Mm. Wow! I'm excited to try this sake. I'm interested to see if like the pink colour changes the flavour in any way. Finally, it's time to try, and I'm so excited to savour some of these celebrated sake. Unfortunately, the pink one's not ready to taste yet. Oh, really? So you can buy this in Australia, so this is very exciting. Ah, it looks like water, yeah. just like straight water. Mm. Oh, it smells so good. Mm. Oh, that's so good. Mm. It's really good. Oh, I'm excited for this one. Whoa, that's yeah, really different from the last one. Wow, that's it's so much sweeter. It's like a more subtle taste. It's a really nice aftertaste. Mm. 
Japan is really good at meticulous, tiny little details, and it shows, you can really tell in the sake. It really depends on what kind of rice they use, the method that they use to create it, and then the water as well. So depending on what the water tastes like, that will change the flavor of the sake. You can tell the care and the love that's gone into this wonderful sake. Delicious. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I've just arrived at the Kunisaki Peninsula and this is apparently one of the first places that they ever started the cultivation of shiitake mushrooms in Japan. So I'm very excited to try because I love shiitake mushrooms. Oita Prefecture is in fact one of the shiitake mushroom cultivation capitals of Japan. And this area is recognized as a globally important agricultural heritage system by the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. Konnichiwa. Ah, konnichiwa. Hajimemashite. Hajimemashite. Mr. Sonata tells me that the shiitake are organically grown and cultivated on logs of sawtooth oak. They're delicious, fresh or dried. But either way, these mushies are magnificent. The pressure is on. You're gonna get one take of this. Uh, uh, oh, 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 that was so satisfying. Then <laughs> put it in here. Right. Oh, okay, we'll try this one. Oh, it's a big one. Here we go. Oh, oh, hey, did it. <laughs> oh, oh, it's a little more firm that one. <laughs> and then this one too. This is really fun, actually. It's surprisingly fun. Very satisfying. Oh. Ah, perfect. And I gotta take this one too, now it's damaged. <laughs> oh, <What>? yay. <laughs> Thank you very much. So now we're gonna dry all the mushrooms that we just picked from the field. Better roll up my sleeves. Rolling up the sleeves. Facing down, I'm assuming. Oh. Okay. Drying the mushroom preserves them, and when they're rehydrated, they're thick, fleshy, and rich in flavor. It takes up to 20 hours for them to be fully dried. So luckily, here we have some prepared earlier. Wow! Oh my gosh! So what? They're beautiful. <laughs> oh, that is so cool. Wow! Oh my god. They're so light. <laughs> oh, it's really hard. Rock solid. That's crazy. It gives off such a strong smell. Yeah, yeah. That would really change the flavor of like anything that you cook it with. And speaking of cooking, Mr. Sonata is showing me how he prepares his fresh and dried shiitake mushrooms. Okay, all right. Put them on a little mini barbecue. Just two of them? Okay. Oh, so these ones have been dried and then they soaked them overnight in water and just water, right? Mizudake de. Oh, you can hear the sizzling. And after just a few minutes on the grill, there's a squeeze of kabosu citrus fruit, a sprinkle of soy, Oh, oh no, I'm I've ruined it now. Hi, arigatouzaimasu. <laughs> and they're good to go. So we'll start with the fresh ones first. Oh, it's so hot. Mmm. Mmm. Wow, that is so good. Mmm. It's not chewy or stretchy or anything like that. So it's like a smoky kind of woody flavor. We'll try these, see how we go. Mm. So these are the ones that were dried. Oh. Mmm, it's really different. The flavor is really strong still, but it's not overpowering. And of course, it goes perfectly with the soy sauce and the kabosu. It's so delicious. If you're in Australia and if you ever see dried shiitake at any store, please try it because it's unlike any other mushroom you've ever eaten, I promise you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Beach is so beautiful. So this is Matama Beach, and it's part of the top 100 best sunset spots in Japan. And I can definitely see why. You can see when it's low tide, there's a lot of these little mini streams, and it reflects the sunset in so many different spots. And it's so beautiful. It's so 
quiet and it's just so peaceful and there's no one around, which is really rare in Japan sometimes. It's really lovely just to walk amongst the water right there and the sunset reflecting off the water. It's so beautiful. There's something really special about it's going to sound weird, but really special about the sun in Japan. <laughs> I know every country has sunsets and Australia has a beautiful sky, but something about Japanese sun that my friends at Into Photography, they really love the Japanese sun because it's a little more softer, it's a little more yellow, a little more orange, or at sunset a little more pink as well. Even though it is just a sunset and you can see them anywhere, it's something really special in Japan as well, and it will make for some beautiful photos. so much fun in the past couple of days here in Oita Prefecture. I got to experience so many things that I never thought that I would get to see and I got to eat such a huge variety of food yet at the same time I kind of feel like I only just scratched the surface of what you really can see here. Every time I travel to a different area of Japan I'm always blown away by how deep and rich the culture and the history is and how little of it I actually know. So if you're coming to Japan and you want to experience something a little bit more different, you should definitely visit Oita Prefecture. So until then, you can check out my YouTube channel for more videos on Oita and Japan in general, and I'll see you here in Oita. Bye.